All right. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the EchoView 15 webinar. My name is Bryony, and I'm here to show you through all of the exciting new features that we've added in this release. EchoView 15 was released last month in October 2024 and has a great range of exciting new features. And I'm going to work through the list shown on this screen during the webinar. There is a lot more in the release than is listed here. I can't get through all of the many, many features that our team has put together, but I'll show you where to find more interest, more information at the end of the webinar. And lots to cover, so let's get started. First topic being platforms and other data flow things. I'm starting with this topic because uh, some of the features that I'll show you especially the data flow things are features that I'll be using a lot across a bunch of different demonstrations today. So it's a good chance to introduce those. And I'll switch to EchoView and we'll start with multiple platform support. And I've got a pre-prepared EV file here for this one. So multiple platform support in EchoView for a very long time, we've had a fairly hard rule of one platform per EV file where that platform has one GPS input, one heading input, depth input, just one set of uh, metrics to describe where that platform is situated. This is great if you're working with a single platform, but for those people who might be wanting to look at perhaps dual transects, like two vessels looking at um, parallel transect data collection, or who might have two different acoustics uh, systems set up in a river in different positions, looking at um, different bodies of water or a vessel and a glider. It makes it really hard to look at that data at the same time because they're located at different places because we can only have one location or one set of GPS inputs. That wasn't really possible. So in Echo V15, now you can create two platforms, which I've done in this EV file. So in this example, we've got two vessels that were surveying kind of beside each other at the same time. So I've got vessel one and vessel two, platform objects for each, where they've each got their own unique sets of GPS and, and other information. So the top right echogram is the first vessel. Sorry, the top left is the first vessel. The top right is the second vessel and their individual cruise tracks are shown below. And as I scroll through this echogram, we can see, we can synchronize these. These are being synchronized in time. So we can see what each of these ships are looking at in the water column at the same time in their unique locations. We can also view this in 3D. So here I've created a 3D scene where I've created curtains for those echograms. I look at that from above, we can see these are the curtains of this little short snippet of data from parallel transects. We can even replay this throughout time to see how that data looked in that 3D georeference space during the survey. So that's multiple platforms. This is just a simple example with uh, acoustic data, but you can bring any type of data in here from any type of platform and start to get a better understanding of what was happening when these uh, data sets were being recorded. Okay, close that one off. The next topic that I'll talk about is automatic platform and transducer information being read from file. And I'll take a look at that by finding some EK80 data. Uh, I'm going to use Echo Explore to find this. So uh, in case you're not familiar with Echo Explore, this is our catalog software that will search your computer and or your network for compatible data files. It will make it available via a map or a list view, uh, and it will show you metadata about those files that have been found on your computer. And I'm looking for an EK80 data type, and I can see this one is going to be useful for me. So I'll open that in Echo View. So the first thing that we see that didn't happen in EchoView 14 is the transducer object now gets a more informative default name where some of the information about that system was read from the data file. So we can see it's a WBT system and we can see the transducer model that was used to collect that. So that's the first thing that's automatically read. 
which just makes it a little bit easier to identify your data in the data flow window. The next thing is in our transducer properties dialog. Um, we can see that some other information is being read from file and automatically filled in. So this is a brand new EV file. I haven't manually changed these values. This has been read from file. So this is identifying the XY position of the transducer on the boat and also the vertical offset for that, that data. Uh, this is fairly important to make sure that when we're looking at multiple frequencies, multiple transducers, and when we're really interested in the very accurate depths in the water column, all of this information will then be fed through to calculating our sample depths uh, and, and so on. So it's just a little tweak that will make setting up a new AV file easier. ECOVIEW will let you know if you open pre-existing EV files that might have different values. Perhaps you haven't set that up yet. So you might see some new information messages popping up when you open EV files in the new version. So this feature is currently implemented for EK80 and EK60 data, and will extend this to other file formats in the future where they have that kind of information stored in the raw data files. So watch this space. And if there are particular file formats you'd like to see this for, do let us know. Next will be some tricks for the data flow window, uh, some just additional changes that we've made to make uh, using, creating, manipulating uh, virtual variables easier. On the left here, hopefully you can see it. I'm sure it's probably quite tiny text on screens, but hopefully it's visible, is the data flow toolbox. This is a relatively new feature in EchoView. I've just got it arranged here below my details window. If you don't have this open, you can find it in the view menu. So view data flow toolbox. There's also a button to launch it and close it quickly and easily as well. So our data flow, flow toolbox was introduced to make it easy to build up your workflow. And we've just added some more improvements to that in EchoView 15. The first is, um, let's just create a new variable to start with. I'll do a background noise removal. So if I select an SV variable and then click and drag background noise removal onto my workflow, that variable is created and has SV data as input. The, one of the features for EchoV15 is if I select two variables, I can now create a variable that uses two inputs. Before, it would only use one of them, and then you'd have to manually configure the second input. So that's quite useful. Um, it's selection aware, which means it knows which order you selected and highlighted variables to create uh, from. So in this case, with the minus variable, we can see input one, input two being indicated by the arrows. And they're important because for a minus variable, operand two is subtracted from operand one. So you do need to get this the correct way around for whatever technique you're working on. This has one as input because I selected this variable first, and then I selected this one second. If I select SV first, background noise removal second and create it, we can see it's the other way around this time. So that just small efficiency for building up your workflow. We can also swap the ordering of variables. So here, if I wanted this to be number one, we can just click and drag and replace it and change the ordering of the inputs. The data flow toolbox is also self selection aware. So if you have nothing selected in the data flow, you get a very long list of all the possible objects you can create. If I select one variable, that list is filtered to just the options that are compatible with that selected variable. If I select a whole bunch of variables, let's do five, we can see that filters even further. There are only two operators in EchoView that will take five variables as input the code operator, which is our Python uh, interface, or the formula operator. So if I create a code operator variable, um, that then is set up and configured with all of those variables that I had selected. 
Um, I'll use the state of flow toolbox quite a lot in my demo because I love it. I find it really useful and helpful and encourage everybody to use it. What's next on the list? Dynamic variable naming. This is another really fun, interesting, useful one that um, once you start using, it's hard to go back from in Echo View 15. The example on the screen has been used in our marketing and promotion where it's a fixed depth example and sort of kind of shows you what's going on, but let's take a closer look in Echo View itself. I'll just move these out of the way. So fixed depth, this is something we can create from our data flow toolbox. I'm going to click and drag a fixed depth line into my workflow here. And we can see before if you created a fixed depth line, it just would be called fixed depth one. Not very helpful, not very useful. And many people would rename that to show what value was actually being used for the depth. So it, you didn't have to look at variable properties all the time to try and figure out what that was. But if you change it, you have to change the name. So dynamic naming makes this easier. Dynamic naming is found in our properties dialog. There we go. And it's a new, uh, some new options that you can see on the name and notes field that weren't previously available. Dynamic naming is available for most objects in our data flow. For some, it's turned on by default with a new object, and for others, you'll need to turn them on manually yourself. Fixed depth is on by default. And we can see we've kind of preconceived uh, information here to make it sensible and easy to use, where we have the name of what this virtual line is, fixed depth. We can see we've got depth here in some curly brackets and some extra information. I'm just going to delete some of this default information and press apply so it's a little clearer what's happening here. Fixed depth, depth in curly brackets where we see that becomes fixed depth zero on the data flow window. If I change the value of depth for this line, press apply, we can see the name of this variable changes on the data flow instantly. And this is because it's dynamically pulling this depth property and reporting its value as part of the name. So that's a, a simple example. Um, let's get a little bit more complicated. I'm going to have a look at this background noise removal variable that I created previously. For background noise, dynamic naming is not on by default, so we can turn that on and we can start to build a dynamic name. For this variable, I might be interested in reporting one of my background noise removal settings in that label. Perhaps I'm going to use a signal to noise ratio as an example. So for signal to noise, we've got a value of 10. We want to report this as part of the dynamic name. However, how do we know what we need to put into those curly brackets? And this is where another new feature in Echo V15 comes in, which is properties information. I've got this here on my right, under my console window, properties information. Uh, if I close this, I can again launch that using view properties information. Now, this dialog, uh, this little window basically tells us what the special name or label is that we want to report as a dynamic name. For every variable property, we'll get just a list of all of the names to help you find out what you can use. Uh, and for a virtual variable, we'll get the operator specific settings as well. I'm just going to expand that background noise removal section and reopen this variable properties dialog. So I want to report minimum SNR. I'm going to guess that this is the minimum signal to noise ratio option listed here. So name and notes, dynamic name, curly brackets, minimum signal to noise ratio, ratio curly bracket close, press apply. If I didn't make any typos, now we see that number 10 being reported. So we can further manipulate this to be a little bit more useful. We might shorten BNR and then brackets, SNR equals brackets. 
and now we can see we've got a new name for this variable shortened to highlight a particular setting where if I change that setting to 20, <laughs> wouldn't use that, but just as an example, that name updates. So that's one useful way to use it. Let's look at um, raw SV as a final example here. And I'm going to be interested in the values that are on the data page for this variable. So I'm going to just make that visible before I open variable properties. So variable properties, name and notes, Let's make it dynamic and let's go SVT1. Let's say apply, we'll go minimum threshold equals early brackets. Apply minimum threshold curly bracket. So I'm getting that to report whether apply minimum threshold is enabled or disabled. And Let's go minimum value equals curly brackets, minimum data threshold. Okay, so now my variable is SVT1, minimum threshold is false, and the value, the minimum data value is minus 70. If I go to the data page, turn on this threshold, press apply. Now it's telling me it's true. So this is useful building your workflow, setting up different variables, making it easy to see where things uh, might need changing or adjusting and what their current values are set to. I've done this for a line and an acoustic variable, but this is available for many different objects that you can interact with in the data flow window. I just spotted a question as well from Alison, thank you. And are these the same property names that are displayed in the console window? Yes. So this is um, all the same system. These uh, properties are what we use in the console, what we use in the command interface, what we use for com scripting. So the same names. And this also makes it, this, this properties information dialog now also makes it really easy to see what you would want to use in the console space as well. Okay, dynamic naming. Exporters is the next topic to cover. These are super exciting. I think people are going to really enjoy using these and setting these up and working with these in Echo View 15 onwards. They're a really helpful way to make sure you can reproduce and repeat and set up what you want to do from an analysis perspective. For those uh, who are particularly familiar with our software, the export menu in EchoView, it's, it's complicated. It's definitely complicated. So when we go up to the Echogram menu in export, there's a whole lot of options of what we call nested menus that you need to step through to try and find the particular export that you're interested in. Uh, so exporters are designed to replace this system with nice visual building blocks that we can easily use and come back to. So let's take one example uh, with some imaging sonar data. This is an EV file that I've set up. I've added some dits and data. I have created a workflow that will clean this data and detect individual fish uh, in this data frame by frame. And then typical for this type of processing is to convert this to a 2D view in which we detect fish tracks and then we analyze those fish tracks to understand more about the fish that were observed with this type of system. There are a few uh, exports that are of interest to this application, but analyzing these fish tracks by region is very common. So for these fish track regions, usually we would go echogram, export, analysis by regions, fish tracks, and then configure that export accordingly Instead, I'm going to create an exporter object. Exporters, again, are in our data flow toolbox. If we go all the way to the bottom, we have this new section called exporters, where you can see the options that are currently available. If I select this target echogram, we can see that list is reduced and I want the fish track analysis. So click and drag that on. 
If you don't want to use the toolbox, these options are also available by right click, new exporter. So you can create it that way, but the toolbox just makes it much faster and easier to drag and drop into the workflow. We now have this new object, this purple uh, block that represents exporters. And these all have properties themselves. Here is our exporter uh, object. It's got a dynamic name already, which is great. And if we click on the exporter specific tab, in this case, the fish track analysis tab, this is where we configure what we'd like to do in this export. So we can choose whether we want to analyze fish tracks by regions or cells. We can choose which region classes we want to export. We can identify specific uh, export variables that we only want for this export. We don't necessarily want to use the same analysis variables across each of our exporters. We can also configure what format that export's going to be in. And once I press OK, all of those selections are saved in that exporter object. And then I just need to double click and um, that export will then be kicked off and created as required. So we can see that this is useful if we want to come back and redo this export later, maybe after changing some settings, we can do exactly the same export by double clicking the object and uh, coming back to it, repeating what we did without having to reconfigure different export settings each time. You can also build this into your templates. So if you're using the same template to process a lot of data files um, and working through those, then that export's just there ready for you to go and use, which is really, really helpful and handy. Exporters can be added using COM and can also be kicked off using com scripts as well. So for those who automate their processing using scripting, this is all accessible via our com interface as well. In EchoView 15, we've mostly focused on the exports in this top section of the menu in terms of shifting them into this new exporter object domain. In future versions of EchoView, the remaining exports will also be available in this way, so we can really start to use it properly. Um, so that is exporters. Um, we have, as I mentioned, uh, quite a bunch that will cover all of the common analysis situations for SV data, single target data, wideband data, and also vegetation. Next up is cruise track customization and editing. And I'm going to find some specific data with Echo Explore. Uh, this data set here. So we've got a little, these are from our tutorial data set that we use uh, for bottom classification. Got a bunch of files here in lakes in North America. Open in EchoView. Right, come onto the right screen. For this particular data set, our maps aren't great. We, by default, show a particular map background called Demus in EchoView, which works okay in some situations and not very well in others here, it's sort of suggesting that this data was collected from land, which is, of course, not the case. The problem we have with this map background is this green cruise track on a green land background is basically invisible. So we've added options to make it possible to change the appearance of cruise tracks uh, to help solve this problem in one way. These options are available in our EV file properties dialog box. So we'll go file. Oops, what have I done here? There we go move things around a little bit. We'll go to the file, uh, view EV file properties, or you can press F6 shortcut to open that dialog. And we've got a new page in EV file properties called cruise track display. By default, it will do what it's always done, but we can override that with some custom settings. We can increase the thickness. It's a little bit more visible, and we can also change the color of the track where um, I might like to simply just make this black. So that becomes instantly more 
easier to see, which is great. We can change the cruise track colors. We can change the colors of the fixes, which you can optionally overlay on the track. We can also change the appearance of the grid. You can make that super thick if that's useful for getting imagery. We also have this background color here. This one's a little bit less obvious, so I'll show you how this works. The background map that Echo is currently displaying that's not working well for this data set, this is the, the Demus WMS map server. If I remove that, this is the background color that EchoView will show. So this is that blue. So on the cruise track display page, I can change that to perhaps white, keep it really simple. And that's what that will, will change there. So these are the, the options here. It will change it for all of your cruise tracks at once. It's not a per cruise track configurable setting. Just makes it really easy to make things a little bit more visible, especially if you've got either a complicated map background or one that's not very useful for the region that you're working in. And while I've got this cruise track open, let's have a quick look at some of the new editing tools in this window that we have for transex and regions. We've had the ability for a long time in EchoView to define regions on cruise tracks, which is great. However, you couldn't edit them. So maybe you wanted to make it a little bit shorter or a bit longer. That wasn't possible. You would just have to delete the region and then try again. We can also define transects, define a transect. So we've got these objects in our cruise track window that are visible, that are covering all of the pings across that section of data that occurs at the same time as, as those um, GPS fixes were collected. So Echo View 15, there are two things. We can now use our region edit tool in this window. So if I activate that tool up here in my toolbar, you can hopefully see it highlighted and I select a region. I can now click and drag the end of that and change and just slightly modify as required. That's easier than having to delete and retry and delete and retry. We also have a new button next to that, which is the transect editing tool. Again, click, drag and change. So that just, just makes that little bit of editing a little bit easier without having to delete and start again. Oh, I just saw a question. I'll answer that quickly before I move on. Uh, can you edit a transect to remove parts in the middle? Unfortunately not. So a uh, transect is just one solid start and end time. If there are parts in the middle that you don't want to analyze, you've got two approaches for that. One is to define a bad data region within that transect. Um, so if I define a region and set that to bad data, that will then not be included in that um, analysis. Uh, if that doesn't work for your situation, the other option would be just to define two transects either side. So you might call this transect 1A and then transect 1B and then combine those for your later analysis. But otherwise, um, yeah, a transect doesn't have gaps in the middle. It's just start and finish, start time and end time. Very simple definition for that. Let's hope that helps. Next topic, extracting bottom metrics. So for this topic, we've had bottom classification in EchoView for quite a while. Basically what we do here, if people aren't familiar, is we partition our pin, pings into discrete classes that, that describe and represent different types of bottom substrates. Could be mud, could be sand, could be rocks. It's an unsupervised process, so we don't actually tell you what it is, we just classify. The bottom classification works by first uh, calculating nine features that describe the first and bo second bottom echoes of your data things like hardness and roughness. And then for those features, we run a principal component analysis and k-means clustering to give you an unsupervised classification result. And this is useful um, in discrete situations, but sometimes people are only interested in the metrics, the features that we calculate and don't want that classification. And so it seems a little bit silly to make people do a classification to get those metrics. 
And so we've made this more accessible in Echo View 15 with a new operator. Let's take a look. So I've prepared a file here. Um, I've got my data. I've defined a bottom line. Uh, to find a bottom line and just just remove background noise as well. So previously we'd run a bottom classification on that echogram, but now we can use a new operator called extract bottom feature and drag that onto my workflow. And this new object represents a time series of information. In this case, let's just pop this out. Take a look at that side by side. And I'm going to make that not green because I don't like the green. Let's make that black. So extract bottom roughness normalized has been created by default. Again, this is using our dynamic naming and default settings. So we can see the extract feature. If we go to our bottom feature page of variable properties for this, this is where we can configure what we want to calculate and explore and over what interval we want to do that for. So by default, we're looking at this across 10 pings. You can change this to other uh, distance grid modes. 10 pings per interval, bottom roughness normalized, but we can change this to hardness or any other metric that of the nine that EchoView will calculate. So we can graph and view this. We can export this data to CSV file. Uh, in the future, we'll be able to do things like integrate this with our acoustic data to perhaps filter pings based on the characteristics of a time series, such as a bottom feature. So that's quite neat, but let's do something a bit fancier. This is also available through live viewing. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of that. I'm using our utility programs, Echolog and EchoSim, to simulate an echo sounder running on my system. Sadly, I'm not on a boat, I'm in the office, so I just need to simulate this one. But I'm just running this data through our Echolog system. I'm going to initiate live viewing, and I've got a, a template with a workspace set up to load the echograms. So I'm making data flow window. Load the epigrams, got a background noise removal here to clean the data, got a virtual line to automatically detect the bottom, which I'm then also just smoothing a little. And then using that information, I'm seeing roughness and hardness being calculated in real time and updating in these graphs. Now it's updating a little slow because, oops, because it's um, calculated for 10 pings, which is sensible, but if I made, oops, if I made that a smaller number, we'd see those updates come through a little faster, just as that data is being um, coming through and being pinged. Um, so this information can be useful in real time. You're out at sea, you want to have an understanding of what the uh, substrate might be like, then this kind of information can be useful. Next topic is EK80 transducer impedance. I think this is our second last one. So impedance, the transmission impedance of a transducer is a factor that can vary due to a number of different physical and environmental things uh, that are happening close to the transducer face. And it can be a useful metric in terms of system performance and maybe some other experimental possibilities as well. EK80 data includes impedance measurements in their files. And so we've made this information available in EchoView for narrowband EK80. Uh, and I think I've still got one of those open. Yes, here we go. So when I loaded up this EK80 file previously, it has a mix of uh, narrowband CW and wideband FM data. For the narrowband variable in this data set, we've got a new pink object here that appears in EchoView. This is called the transmission characteristics. And this layered icon represents the fact that there's a few levels of information that are basically captured within this object. When I've got this selected, we can see in our Dataflow toolbox that we've got one particular operator uh, that's ready to use with this type of data. So let's click and drag that on. 
And what we're seeing here is impedance median for the transducer by default. Make this a bit easier to see again. Okay, so the variable properties for this one, we've got a number of statistics that we can calculate. So median, interquartile range, and maximum. And we can calculate those for the transducer as a whole or for any of the individual sectors. Let's change this to sector one. So for sector one, we can see the values there. I can copy and paste this. Let's make that sector two. We can have a look at that alongside that same data and so on for all of the sectors. So it gives us the opportunity to explore the data, to potentially identify problems with one of the sectors or a transducer as a whole. Uh, and in the future, we'll be able to do things such as filter data based on impedance values, which will be really useful. We can also export this to CSV file if we like. One thing you want to take note of is graphs by default will scale to the data that's being shown. What you might like to do to make this easier to compare is to set fixed limits on these axes, axes, 52 to 63. Do the same on this graph just to make sure when we compare, we're actually looking at you know, data appropriately. That's just a little trick that's sometimes not so obvious where it will scale depending on the data in that graph. It doesn't necessarily know about the other graphs. Our next feature, final feature to talk about are the new school metrics that we've added in ECOV15 and classification. Classification isn't actually new, but registrations for this webinar showed that that was of a lot of interest to people. So I thought it would be a good opportunity just to quickly duck into that and to show how these new metrics can be used in that classification process. So the new metrics are based on published algorithms. We have those algorithms fully documented in our help file on the pictured page. I won't go into the equations here, but encourage you to read that documentation if you're interested. Let's have a look in EchoView, pre-prepared file. So we've got some data here. We've done the cleaning, we've done school detection, We've got a number of different regions here where we can see they've definitely got some different shapes here in terms of their length to thickness ratio. And elongation, one of the five new metrics is the ratio of length to thickness and can be a good way in some fish populations to discriminate different species. So we can use automatic region classification to get EchoView to make this easier for us based on these properties. Let's see how this is done very quickly. Again, this isn't new in ECOV15, but good opportunity to revisit something that is not necessarily easy to find. So in this EV file, my regions are all currently unclassified, but I've created a tall region class and a long region class for the example. And then what we want to do is go to our region classification page. This is where we set up the rules uh, for classification. So we want to add a rule. For this rule, I want to set anything that meets the criteria to tall regions. I'm going to add this analysis variable. By default, we've got SV mean, but I'm going to change that to elongation. So for tall regions, I want below or equal to a value of five for elongation. Actually, I forgot to show you that these values. One moment. It's my spreadsheet. So I previously exported uh, the regions that we saw in EchoView. I've just done a very reduced region that focuses on the school's parameters and transposed those results here. So the green cells, they're the new metrics that we've got available. And I've highlighted a couple of the elongation values for interest. We can see there's two, two of the regions have quite small values, 0.6 and 2. And some of them have very high values in the high 30s. 
small values are these guys, these tall and thin ones, and the bigger values are the longer ones that we can see close to the seafloor. So for tall regions, I want a value less than five. And then for long regions, I want a value of more than five for corrected elongation. And so that's set up our rules. Press OK, that's ready to go. In the echogram menu, we have classify regions. Once I run this, let's just change the color scheme to make that more obvious. Once I run this, these unclassified regions have now been put into a class based on these properties of elongation. So we've got tall regions and long regions. This one's a pretty simple example, but you can set up far more complicated and meaningful rules using this region classification dialog to do a first pass classification of the different school regions you've got in your data to help you try and separate out what they are based on expected parameters where every single analysis variable that we calculate for regions is available for that purpose. So there's a lot of options here and you can build up some really fancy and complicated classifications through this process. All right, so that's all the Echoview 15 features I'm going to demonstrate. I will just talk briefly about licensing. We've been mentioning for a little while now that we're working on a new licensing technology for Echoview, and that's come quite a long way in Echoview 15. The first is that we have digital license keys now available. This is where we can give you a license to use Echoview without a dongle. We'll send you a code. We'll, you'll activate that code on your computer, computer locked license. And we found that this is super useful for training courses and evaluations where we can give you a license to Echoview really quickly and easily to send you an email rather than having to arrange popping a USB dongle in the post much more convenient and faster and easier for all of us, which is great. In this new licensing technology, we've also got new types of dongles. For anyone who purchases a license from now onwards, you'll get a different looking dongle to those you might be familiar with. Otherwise, it's pretty seamless and should just operate the same. However, the new dongles have some additional capabilities that are quite exciting. The first is it doesn't block remote desktop. So our old licensing didn't work under remote desktop, uh, but this new technology can operate with, with remote desktop, which is really helpful. The other capability that it allows us is we don't have separate perpetual and timed dongles now. We just have a single type of dongle, which can do perpetual licensing and it can do timed licensing. And this opens up the possibility where you can combine perpetual license capabilities and timed capabilities on a single license. So for example, you might like a perpetual Echoview Essentials license, and then you might wish to have you know, six months of use of fish tracking, and then you don't need it after that. And this is now possible on a single dongle, and it wasn't possible with the old licensing technology. So that's quite exciting and we're, we're seeing people using that, which is great. The people with existing licenses, they can swap their dongles over to this new system for an E and that's available for Echo V15 onwards. Uh, and we're currently also working on the ability to have network license keys. So that's floating licenses within an organization and also cloud licensing as well. So watch this space on those two topics. I mentioned at the start, lots of new features in Echoview. Always encourage people to read the new in Echoview 15 help file page, which will describe all of the different things that you can find. If you're unsure about any of the features or would like a demo or just not quite sure where to get started, then please reach out and email our support email address and we'll be more than happy to help with that. To get the latest version of Echoview, we can download from our website or we can use our built-in updater to check for updates. This will also make any, gives you the opportunity to explore what bug fixes or changes we might have added to Echoview after the initial main release. What's next? We're currently working on both Echoview 15.1 and 16. Uh, Echo V15.1 will be a free update with some just targeted specific features 
as always if you've got things you'd like to see in echo view please email and echo view 16 will be our next major release and without giving away too much too early we'll have a variety of interesting new features across mapping wideband analysis new file formats more exporters as i suggested things in the net cdf space new operators and more so watch this space and uh, we'll, we'll have information later next year around that release and just finally wanted to sneak this one in here i just wanted to highlight and identify the services that we offer here at echoview uh, we have a science team, seven staff that are committed to supporting our users and their science requirements. Uh, this includes, of course, our technical support and our, our advice for people who are getting started in acoustics, and buying equipment and thinking what they need to solve particular research goals. But we also, of course, offer additional services. We have training and workshops. We do consulting and data processing. We can help you um, get a head start on developing a workflow to solve a particular research problem and hand that over and train you on how to use that so that you can get uh, upskilled and started doing what you need to do more quickly. We can offer calibration services and we can also do custom software development for you. So if any of this is of interest, please be sure to reach out and, and chat to see what might be possible. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope you found it useful. I'll, I'll check for questions. And if you've got other questions, please send them through either in the chat dialogue or feel free to email us after the event as well. But thank you very much.